Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Justin Warland. I'm a correspondent at Time Magazine. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today for this iteration of the Race to Zero Dialogues. We have a, a very uh, exciting program today, um, and we're focusing on uh, ocean sustainability uh, and technology, uh, you know, specifically looking to answer the question of how ocean's potential can be harnessed to uh, help tackle climate change. Um, I just want to note that this session is being live streamed and recorded. Um, and uh, before we, oh, and also we have a, uh, we were going to start with some opening remarks and then we're going to go into a, a panel discussion uh, that I will moderate, but we also have uh, the ability, it's an interactive uh, session. So we would love for anyone to contribute their questions. You can do that on slido.com. The information as you can see is on the screen here. Uh, and the event code is hashtag race to zero. So again, this is for the uh, moderated panel that follows the opening remarks. Um, please do uh, contribute your questions. Um, and so with that, I wanna uh, just start off with our opening remarks. Uh, and we have to start Stan Rowland, uh, who is the chairman and chief executive officer of the Blue Climate Initiative. Uh, thank you, Stan. Thank you, Justin. My name is Sam Rowland, and I'm the CEO and, uh, of the Blue Climate Initiative and Chairman and President of Teddy Rara Society, which is an environmental nonprofit uh, operating in the island of Teddy Rara in French Polynesia. And um, the Blue Climate Initiative is a global effort to protect the ocean and to reasonably and responsibly use the incredible power of the ocean to address some of the most important environmental challenges and ultimately social challenges of our time. So today I wanna to set the stage for the discussion that follows. But first, I, I just can't resist saying how absolutely thrilled and delighted I am that we now have removed one of the biggest roadblocks we have in the race to zero, which is the Trump administration. This historic change brought by the US election clears the road ahead of us. And with a Biden and Harris administration coming on board, the opportunities are absolutely tremendous. And so this is, this is now really up to us to make it happen. Uh, there are a variety of opportunities for success in the battle against climate change. And one opportunity that we believe deserves more attention is ocean-based solutions. The ocean provides an enormous opportunity to help turn the tide on climate change, whether directly through carbon capture and sequestration or more directly through programs such as harvesting its potential as a source of renewable energy or lower carbon food. And a lot can be accomplished simply by protecting the oceans. Restoring the oceans can help restore planetary health and our own health and well-being. So what are we at the Blue Climate Initiative doing in this regard? Uh, First off, we're doing cutting edge research and private investment to advance innovative ocean solutions. We want to try to do is use new technologies and scientific understanding, plus traditional knowledge to work alongside the ocean's own absolutely miraculous natural systems to harvest the ocean's potential to, to tackle climate change. So how are we doing this? Uh, we brought together from around the world some of the best minds on ocean issues to work collaboratively to identify and develop the most promising ocean-based transformational opportunities to combat climate change. These experts have met in six working groups addressing the issue from six different angles. Renewable energy and marine transportation, nature-based solutions, food and energy, human health and well-being, mineral and genetic resources, and sustainable tourism. But now how does one go about determining what are the most promising transformational opportunities? We think it starts with asking a very broad question that provides freedom to be bold and ambitious, which is really what we need right now. The fundamental question asked of each of our working groups was, what would you do with a billion dollars and broad support to mitigate climate change and the target issue of your working group? Approaching climate change from this perspective allows one to think outside the box. For example, uh, when in a different context, another marine biologist, Doug McCauley, was asked the question of what he would do with a million dollars to address climate change. Rather than coming up with a more expected marine biology-based answer, he said that he would invest in energy storage. I'm knowing this not for the answer, but even though I think it's important, but rather to illustrate the value of stepping back and think about the issue from a big picture, impact-focused way. 
This approach also provides freedom to think about different types of solutions. So for example, one of the ideas coming out of our nature-based solutions working group is to designate the, the world's entire high seas as a marine protected area with specific use exceptions to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, my point is not the concept itself, but rather illustrate the value of us all stepping back and thinking boldly, which in, in this case resulted in a, a suggested paradigm shift. So our working groups have now completed their transformational opportunities papers and we'll be publishing them in the next couple of months. But the Blue Common Initiative is not leaving the process there. Ideas are, of course, useless without, without action. Um, so in this next phase we're moving into, we're bringing together a broad coalition of scientists, entrepreneurs, business people, investors, community leaders, policymakers, and influencers to assist in implementing and acting upon the ideas developed in the first phase of the initiative through the transformational opportunities papers. Another strategy we're implementing is using incentive prizes and community awards to generate ideas and accelerate action. In fact, I'd like to announce today that in January, we'll be launching an innovation challenge focused on ocean-based climate solutions mm -hmm with a minimum of $500,000 in prize money. So working together will be absolutely critical in the face of the existential threats we are facing. And I hope we all use this moment that aligns with this historic shift in the US administration to pull our resources and work collaboratively as a single, single planet in the race to zero. So with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Catherine Palmer. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for this opportunity to, to give some opening remarks to this session. Um, my name is Catherine Palmer. I am the Global Head of Sustainability for um, Lloyd's Register Marine and Offshore Business. So the words um, I would like to share with you today are predominantly focusing on the global shipping sector and how it is essential for a sustainable future as it meets both the demands of its customers and society, but as one of the many ocean users competing for space and resources, it needs to ensure itself that it is sustainable so our oceans remain healthy and productive. The key challenge that the industry is facing at the moment is exactly the same as other sectors and countries and society as a whole, and that is how does it de decarbonize? And there's no doubt that the decarbonisation challenge for the maritime sector is going to be disruptive, it's going to be transformational, and it's going to affect all players across the maritime ecosystem. The evolution of both the energy system and the shipping system that is needed alongside the associated timescales of development, investment and asset lifespan means that there are steps that need to be initiated now and work that needs to be commenced and carried out in this decade so that zero carbon energy can play a key role from 2030 onwards in order to be able to deliver a goal of net zero by 2050. The pace of this transition really relies on three key factors and the interaction between them, that is technology, investment and community readiness. So this means from a technology perspective, the advances needed in ships themselves is that they get their energy from zero carbon sources. And that also there is the development of the infrastructure to deliver this energy at the volume that is needed and in the right locations. And so therefore all actors need to join this global effort, ranging from the energy providers, the financers and the customers alongside support from governments to ensure that we have a fundamental shift in policy and market incentives to increase the uptake of zero carbon energy. There's no doubt that decarbonizing shipping will come at a price. It has been estimated that an additional $6 trillion over the next 50 years to achieve the IMO goals is needed. And that includes both from the ship side and from the land side, including production, storage and distribution. And so when we see from a vessel perspective that the technology does exist today and we can build those ships, this is more of an OPEX challenge for the ship owner than it is for a, a, a CAPEX challenge. 
because we know that to start with, zero carbon fuels are going to be more expensive than existing fossil-based fuels that the shipping system is built around today. So although clarity is needed on fuel price and availability, as it's these primary concerns that are preventing any owners and charterers from ordering vessels today, we know that we need incentives um, in order to reduce the cost of technology and to build that business case. And so we see that this is very much a landslide challenge, but shipping can be used as a catalyst for the wider energy transition in unlocking the market for zero carbon fuels because of the sheer size of the um, scale of the challenge for the sector. And so there is a need to have confidence to act and in order to invest to accelerate this shift. And in order to do that, we need to come together, not only to create a deeper understanding, but also to innovate and, and do pilots and prototypes and demonstrate the art of the possible in terms of safety, sustainability, and economic costs. And we know that innovation is already taking place. A lot of this is self-funded by ambitious business leaders, but also supported by governments. This innovation is taking place across the world from Europe to Asia, and is very much focused on these challenges of ship technology, ship design, and producing fuels. And it's this coming together of like-minded leaders that is really gathering momentum at the moment. At the end of, um, of October, Lloyd's Register itself announced the partnership to accelerate the safe and sustainable transition to zero carbon shipping. And we will be working in partnership across the value chain for the benefit of delivering a safe and sustainable future for society. Another initiative uh, which was launched just over a year ago was the Getting to Zero Coalition which in its um, life of, of one year has really grown to unite more than 100 public and private sector stakeholders. This is a leading example of one of the many initiatives that have been launched to address this challenge, as everybody in the maritime ecosystem wants to engage and be part of finding the solutions. And so what we have shown as the shipping industry is that ambitious business action can create our own future. And as we now enter this decade of action to deliver our vision of commercially viable zero emission shipping by 2030, this is the time for collective action and collaboration. And it's a really exciting sector to be part of in this race to zero. Thank you. Thank you, um, both Catherine and, and, and Stan. This, I think, very, uh, very does a great job of setting the stage um, for our panel, uh, which we are going to jump into just now. Um, I want to, um, again, remind people that they can ask questions on Slido when we get to that portion. Um, but uh, for now, I'm going to introduce the panel. Uh, we have uh, Richard Bailey, who is the chairman and CEO of the uh, Pacific Beachcomber uh, and president of the Brando Resort. Uh, Jayotika Bermani, who's executive director of the Schmidt Ocean, Ocean Institute. Uh, Claire Jolly, who is the head of innovation policies for space and oceans unit at OECD. And Marlo Sinamena, uh, who, excuse me, Marcelo Mena, uh, who is a uh, director of the uh, Centro de Acción Climática at Pontifica Universidad Católica de Valparaiso. Um, and, and, I, and I apologize uh, to, to uh, Jotica if I said it wrong. I think, I think that's right, Jotica, but um, please, please correct me if I'm wrong. My sincere apologies. Um, I, did, I did want to start with you, uh, actually, and just, just to, to throw out the, the, the first question, uh, you know, oceans are often thought of as, as the last frontier. You work a lot, I should say the last frontier on earth. You work a lot uh, on, uh, you know, thinking about technology and uh, that we need uh, and innovation that we need to better understand oceans. I just, I wonder if you could just give us a sense of what you think uh, we need to see to, to, to both better understand oceans broadly, but to better understand oceans in a way that can help us fight climate change. Uh, thank you, Justin, and uh, good morning to everyone from LA. Um, 
Uh, I actually just want to take a quick moment to acknowledge uh, that I'm sitting uh, at home uh, on the tribal land of the Chumash tribe of Southern California. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, uh, also, I just want to say, Justin, don't worry, my name is Jotika. I've heard all sorts of variations on the name. So uh, uh, thank you for I'll get it uh, next time. <laughs> No worries. Uh, that's a really good question. So I think a lot of people don't fully realize how vast the ocean is, the scale of the magnitude we're looking at. It's, it covers about 99% of the living space on this planet. It's, it's such a massive feature for the climate system. Uh, and so part of the huge push in innovation that we really need uh, to really understand it, most of it's not understood yet even, is um, unmanned, uncrewed and autonomous technologies so that we can scale up and get a better understanding of what's going on out there. So uh, with respect to, for example, climate, uh, it was only five years ago when we got uh, pH sensors to measure ocean acidification, to make lab quality measurements that were the same as if you brought water back into the lab and analyzed it. Um, bringing water back to the lab, of course, is ship. It is very expensive. It takes ships. Um, having sensors that can do this now automatically that you can leave it in, in the water for a period of time really changes how we monitor for ocean acidification changes in the ocean most of which has not yet been, uh, we really have no clue about at the moment. So that's just one example, but that's what we're really heading towards is being able to um, make these sensors and these technologies operate for us and gather the critical data we need to monitor and see what's going on out there. Great. Um, well, I wanted to ask, uh, well, first I should just say, please do, if anyone on the panel wants to jump in, please feel free to, but I'm, I'm going to go uh, to, to Claire next. And I just wanted to ask a bit about uh, some of the uh, sort of innovations that might be helpful, um, you know, not necessarily from a sort of, um, um, you know, uh, underwater perspective or, or, you know, on the ocean perspective, but innovations in, in financing, innovations and in, in the way that we can uh, think of policy solutions to help with oceans. Uh, what are some of the things that you're thinking about there? So, so thank you very much for, for the question. Uh, and uh, obviously, as we heard from the previous speakers, uh, I think at the core of the two big challenges that we face today, namely climate change and the loss of biodiversity, the ocean plays really a key role in helping us find solutions. So not only do we need ocean observations, and we just had heard that also from a previous speaker, um, observations of many kinds to improve our collective knowledge and contributing to fundamental science, but the ocean itself has become the siege of many environment-friendly innovations in terms of communications, transport, food security, energy. So maybe in terms of some of the um, um, uh, innovations that may not be technical here, technological, but we published uh, just a, a year ago, a little less than a year ago, uh, a report, a OECD report called Rethinking Innovation for a sustainable ocean economy. And there we found uh, that successful innovation into the ocean requires often really fresh thinking in the organization and the structure of the research process itself. So we studied at the OECD the emergence of new forms of collaboration in the ocean economy, often supported by governments, um, and that link the research communities, public sector, the academic world, the private sector stakeholders. Uh, and we use the example of innovation networks that have really sprang up in recent years around the world, dedicated to the ocean. Huh? So it's very, I have to say, it's really new. We found several dozens uh, and looked already at 10 in particular conducting surveys and workshops. So they are often hosted by a research institute or innovation net, uh, centers, or they emerge from an existing uh, industry cluster with a bit of public support very often. So they connect very different actors. They work on a range of innovations, typically marine robotics, autonomous vehicles, aquaculture, marine renewable energies, biotechnologies, and they, their benefits uh, include improved cross-sector synergies, and I'm sure we come, we come back to that at some point, access to research facilities, that's inside. So one very important factor here that I would like to maybe stress uh, is the development of the new science industry linkages in these networks. 
Um, and that's pretty new in the ocean space, I have to say. And this is going to be crucial as we head into the United Nations a Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Both science and industry will need each other even more. And this can work uh, just for maybe people are not really aware that over a half in over half of OECD countries, more than 50% of researchers are actually employed in business enterprises. So these new ways of cooperating in the ocean space are encouraged in part by increased digitalization. This allows more actors to know about each other um, and then to work together. We see co-creation models uh, where the knowledge is jointly developed through shared facilities, mixed teams. We see also new open innovation models meaning not everything is in a black box. Uh, new ways to balance commercial intellectual property and research imperatives. So uh, we see this in Europe, in parts of Asia and in the US. Uh, we will actually have next week a workshop um, on this new ocean economy networks in North America with a large participation from uh, Canadian and American stakeholders uh, this is co-organized with the um, uh, Canadian uh, Ocean Super Cluster. So in order to conclude here, maybe just on this particular point, again, with some public support, we are seeing new networks being born. And I think that they really respond to some of the challenges that we are talking about here. So. Great. I mean, I think, oh, sorry, please finish. I didn't want to. No, 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 that, that's fine. Um, well, there's a lot of threads, I think, that can that, that are worth, uh, you know, pulling out of there. And I, and I think, I mean, it sort of segues nicely uh, into my next question, which was for, for Richard, you, you, you talked about science and industry working together. And I know that this has been something that, you know, Richard, you are working on on the ground. So I wonder if you might just, um, you know, introduce us to what yeah, you do, what your business is, and then talk a bit about those linkages, uh, you know, in your business. Uh, very happy to do that and uh yes i'm very happy to be on the call and to join all of you thank you very much my name is richard bailey i uh, my business is hospitality i'm from Polynesia. i build and operate a resort hotel um and um actually we have uh, one specific innovation uh, we won the race to zero, and it's a pretty nice place to be. Uh, we've uh, pioneered a, a technology that we call seawater air conditioning, uh, where we use deep seawater, which is very cold, uh, to air condition uh, one of our properties, uh, the Brando, on uh, Te Te Aro, uh, Atoll. Um, and... Um, it's a completely carbon neutral, uh, self-sustaining, uh, non-fossil with renewable energy uh, resort. Um, and uh, the, the seawater air conditioning is a very, it's a simple process. And we put a pipe down to about a thousand meters. We have a, a proximate deep ocean water very near the resort. And um, the water is about four and a half degrees. Uh, and we use that to through a thermal uh, exchanger to transmit the cold into a fresh water loop. And we air condition our entire property, and this reduces our energy requirement by about two thirds. And the balance of our energy is easily accomplished with uh, solar and uh, a small amount of thermal energy using uh, coconut oil, which is a perfectly legitimate uh, biofuel. Um, so, um, it's, it's a scalable process. It can be done pretty much anywhere in the world. The technological constraint is to have proximate deep sea water. Uh, the financial constraints would be uh, to, um, to have a, a high cost of alternative electricity in order to uh, bring the return on investment horizon into a reasonable uh, a reasonable scale um, and um, a year-round need for uh, cooling uh, again a financial constraint so anywhere in the tropics with proximate deep sea water and most island communities have 
high cost of energy to begin with. Uh, so this is a process that uh, could be uh, could be uh, used in many different places. Um, we're, I believe, we're the world pioneers for this uh, process. We didn't have any examples to go on, but uh, we sort of cobbled the various components together ourselves. Um, it's not it's not uh, technologically difficult. Uh, it does require some investment. Um, but it's profitable uh, to us. It's our lowest cost uh, per kilowatt hour of energy uh, that we have. Um, and I would add, as a resource, uh, uh, being deep sea water, deep sea water is more charged with uh, carbon dioxide and surface water. And we're attracting a lot of interest from the scientific community because uh, we can use this deep sea water to simulate uh, surface conditions in, say, 25, 50, 75 years. And we know that the pH factor is gradually declining in the oceans due to acidification from absorbing all of the carbon dioxide resulting from climate change. And this acidification can have dramatic impacts on uh, small ocean creatures, exoskeletal calciferas, plankton, and small shrimps and whatnot. And these are critical elements of the food chain. So um, using this deep sea resource uh, can also inform us as to where exactly that threshold of, of danger occurs in, uh, in vanishing layers of the food chain. So um, it's, uh, we, you know, we're just one small resort on one small island in the Pacific, but um, what we've done is, is, is the innovation that we've accomplished has been motivated by uh, the symbiosis and tourism that we're trying to achieve, whereby uh, reducing our energy footprint, our, our guests are attracted, and the more guests we have, the more we can afford to reduce our energy footprint. So that's basically the so oh, it looks well, like we lost my video. Yeah, we, I think they turned off the video to improve um, the sound quality, and it, it definitely did improve. So I, I know I am also dealing with a, a poor connection, so you might lose my video at some point, but for now we're good. But th thank you for those remarks. Um, that, that is a, a, there's a lot of threads to pull there as well. Um, Mar uh, Marcelo, I want to I wanna turn to you next and just to ask, uh, uh, just about Chile and about the uh, way in which uh, oceans have been uh, uh, incorporated into uh, thinking about uh, emissions reductions and, and how that's worked uh, on the ground on the ground in Chile. Great, thanks, Justin. So it's it's incredible that for many decades we had ignored our oceans and the role it had on conservation and on on carbon capture on resilience, but also as an opportunity to shift our productive identity from one that is extractive in nature to one that generates renewable fuels as we require for the world to net reach net zero. And just to start off, first off, we started trying to understand what was going on and justifying some things. And we had in a way a vision that this could be beneficial. Um, around 65% of fisheries in Chile are overexploited. Uh, you've heard about the Chilean sea bass, the orange roughy. These have really reduced their, their, their availability substantially and we needed to conserve. And we went from protecting 4% of our oceans to 43% when I was in the government with uh, President Bachelet as minister. And this really changed the identity of protecting because this really led the charge for new efforts which have this COP25 be the blue COP in a way. But with time, science has shown us that we were in the right way, in the right path. Uh, there's a professor, Anthony Waldron from, uh, from, uh, from University of Cambridge, Cambridge University, that has uh, shown that conserving around 30% of the world, both oceans and land, increases uh, forestry, uh, the, the GDP out of forestry, 
increases agricultural yield, and of course, it also increases fishing. Because when you provide the space for fish to reproduce, you get all the overflow and you're able to recover species. This is about not killing the golden goose, uh, the golden egg goose, but letting it give you the eggs at the time that it can, which is really good. But since we also wanted to show that we needed to protect the ocean beyond that as people, we started establishing the plastic bag ban that, you know, so you can't have any plastic bags in Chile today. This is something that we hope other countries replicate. Some have started. And we're starting with a new introduction of, with a new minister of, of single use plastics being banned, which is also very important because however net zero emissions we are going to be, there's still gonna be that plastic straw that we used back in the day, 50 years from now, even with a net zero world. So we need to clean up that plastic. But going from that, um, the important thing that we need to, to, to consider is what carbon capture could occur. And recently, the World Bank put out a report shows that our fjords, our uh, macroalgal uh, forests are able to capture around 10% of our national emissions, which is good. That means we need to conserve them and keep the ecosystems resilient to natural disasters. You know, they dissipate energy from a tsunami. Healthy coastal ecosystems are able to recover faster, which is also good. But then we started looking at this new opportunity. You guys have heard about the renewable energy investments in Chile that have been very big. But as we uh, see for the future, we start noticing that our copper demand will rise substantially because it's part of all the wiring of the panels of the uh, turbines, of the electric cars. Lithium is also gonna rise in demand, but it has to be clean. And so therefore our copper, which is around three kilograms of CO2 per, per kilogram of copper need to clean up. Around two thirds of that is electricity and renewable energy contracts are being signed by all the copper mines and they're gonna to get to net zero right away with the, the scope two energy. But scope one, the mining trucks need to clean up and that's where green hydrogen comes in. And this allows us to also expand green hydrogen to be available for the maritime sector, for aviation sector. And so therefore, um, you know, we put out a, a strategy last week with the minister Jove, I was part of the committee, and which set out really huge numbers. I'll just give you a few. Going to export around $33 billion in green hydrogen is around 10% of Chile's GDP. It will potentially replace mining. Mining will subside, mining will disappear. These are finite elements. Hydrogen is not. So this allows us to shift from an extractive based economy to a renewable uh, economy. $330 million in accumulated investments. That's huge also. And this is part of what our net zero strategy considers because we have committed to net zero by 2050 and we know that this will create more growth, more job creation as a study that the World Bank Commission for that uh, really showed, uh, recently showed. So this is really good as, as so going from turning our back on the ocean and turning it into the opportunity for uh, long-term growth and, and prosperity for our country. Great. Well, thank you. I, I, I want to follow up with, with a question and then I hope others will chime in as well. But, you know, obviously Chile, along with many other countries, has both a, uh, an unconditional and a conditional uh, commitment regarding its, its emissions. And a lot of the, the conditional commitment is contingent upon support from other countries. And I just wonder if you could talk a bit about the mechanisms, the, uh, the, the partnerships that allow, could, will allow Chile to meet those uh, conditional uh, 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 targets and, and you know, particularly with regard to oceans, but broadly as well. Yeah, I think um, down the line, it, it's just a struggle that we have as a country, whether we are developed or we're on the way to being developed, I, I think is really uh, that we have to consider. But I would say I would, that's the stuff that the Minister of Finance put, forces you to put in your commitments. It's not really sure. true. You know, we have around $10 billion in investments going on uh, today at this moment being on, you know, on renewable energy. None of that's GCF. None of that is uh, Jeff. None of that is climate finance per se. It's our for-profit market design that makes right. renewable energy just work. And that's why Trump, despite all his efforts to, to go down with, a, you know, with coal, there's no new coal and there's 20% increase in renewable energy investment. So it's just a matter of gravity. The market has spoken. These other technologies are obsolete 
and we need to spend the money that we can. And when we need additional funding, we could uh, go to a green bond that allows us to have the lowest interest rates that we have ever achieved since the recovery of democracy. So there's many things that we could do and developing countries can also do. And that's what we have to do. Just be smart about the way you design and not really have a subsidized heavy system, but one that really allows the markets to work. But that starts with recognizing the price of pollution. If we ignore the price of pollution, none of this thing uh, will actually happen. Great. Um, Claire, do you, have, do, you, do you have any thoughts? Is there anything you'd like to, to, to add just about policy and, 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 and uh, support uh, in, that, in that regard, not necessarily with Chile, but with uh, countries more broadly? Yeah, absolutely. And, and indeed, Chile is a member of the OECD and has been very active in all the committees of the OECD. So, uh, so that's why discussion between developed and developing countries is still very much uh, to be discussed, I would say here, because Chile has been really leading quite a number of, of, of innovations, actually, even in the ocean space. So maybe what I could say in terms of some of the I, support. I sidestep. So I, I would just say I note that I sidestepped that debate by just referencing the NDC rather than trying to get into the debate. But sorry to please continue. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. But but in terms of the the policy instruments that are in place, uh, I mean we have a whole catalog that we that we just uh, uh, published again uh, in a re recent OECD report um, on sustainable ocean for all. Uh, whereas here you have a list of policy instruments that exist. And they range from uh, economic instruments uh, to regulatory instruments, typically tax, but also helpful subsidies. We always have to be very careful with subsidies. But uh, quite a number of levers that government have in order to support innovation and to support innovative uh, sectors. Uh, they already are well known in different domains like agriculture, uh, now they need to be really adapted and used in the ocean space. Um, but there may be one little thing about this question of innovation and, and ocean. Very often where we will need the most innovations, and I think uh, our colleague from Chile uh, mentioned it, and our colleague here uh, uh, from the Pacific Island already had also a very good example. We need a lot of innovations at the, the ocean land nexus, basically coastal zones. In order to reduce uh, pollutions from plastics, we need to actually invest quite a lot in treatment system, pollution treatment systems. And that's true for many developing countries. That's where we need to invest a lot. And that will preserve the ocean and climate down the road. So a lot of the innovations that we think about are often really land-based uh, and will benefit the ocean. And there too, you have a list of instruments that exist where you can encourage as a country, as a government, that or that innovations. Great. Well, yes, please. Can I add uh, something? I agree there uh, very much the innovations um, are needed in that uh, ocean land intersection because that's where we all are. That's where we're polluting from. Um, but I do think that we have to be careful on what those innovations are. Uh, so they're not just single minded solving one problem. And then in 10 years or 50 years, we find that it's actually caused a different problem. And that's where we ran into an issue with plastics. So when plastics first came about 60, 70 years ago, it was, uh, you know, the solve all, the be all, the amazing new thing. Um, and it's fine removing plastics, but then you have to take the whole cycle into consideration. So heavier material or like biodegradable plastic, for example, um, quite often requires very high temperatures. So it makes no difference if it ends up in the ocean, unless it's sitting on an hydrothermal vent, it's still gonna be plastic in the ocean. So really uh, look at the whole life cycle and all the impacts as we, as we move forward with those innovations. And what is the, repercussion and impact on the environment um, from, from multiple angles. Well, I, I wonder if you could, you know, offer, is there a good framework to think about those kinds of questions? I mean, is it a life cycle analysis or how does one begin to think about that? Yes, it is actually, it's very much a life cycle analysis and it's part of what, you know, the first speaker this morning um, was saying was thinking outside the box. So remove, um, something like what how much will it cost 
and, and then you really start to drill down once you've got that out of your head of what the issues really are but it is a life cycle analysis so for example uh going back to the plastics world um there are companies that are switching to biodegradable lids uh, for coffee cups and then there's others who've switched back because they found that the carbon footprint of transporting the heavier weight material has actually is actually offsetting the benefit of having biodegradable plastic so it's really very much a life cycle um uh, issue and I think you know it's very complicated because we don't know everything about the oceans and what all the repercussions are going to be anyway but I have hope because um, uh, every year we learn more and we're learning more at a faster pace because of innovation so um, it's said that in the next decade the UN decade of ocean science um, we the technology we have will give us something like 10,000 uh, times more data and information than we've had in the entire human lifespan on the ocean so far. So we will learn a lot very fast, very quickly. So I think it's building in that learning into the innovation process. And I guess, Claire, maybe that touches on your science and industry um, cycle a bit there as well in, in making sure that everyone's well informed. Right. Well, I guess uh, first I, I'd love to move to questions. Um, so please, uh, please uh, continue to submit them on Slido if you haven't. Um, but I'll just ask, uh, and here's the information about how you can do that. Again, the hashtag is race to zero. Um, I, I'll just ask one more question um, um, for Richard uh, while we, uh, before we get into questions from the audience, which is just maybe you could offer some perspective about how you think about or have thought about these, uh, you know, uh, trade-offs or, or questions uh, when you're thinking about implementing on the ground at your resort. How do you think? Who do you consult? How do you look at these questions? Right. <clears throat> well, we're guided first of all in my business by guest experience. Um, so we're looking for what guests need to be comfortable and happy. If we take care of the guests, then everything else takes care of itself. Um, coming through innovations regarding energy and infrastructure, um, we're looking for solutions that are helpful to uh, envi the environment, but are also profitable. Um, we believe that, as, as I think uh, Marcelo mentioned, we believe in ideas that are capable of mobilizing uh, cattle from the private sector without uh, without a lot of stimulus because we believe that uh, ultimately this is this is what will lead to massive change uh, in the world. So, so innovations that are simply great technology um, that that we that we invest in out of some deep conviction that this is the right thing to do is all well and good but if the right thing to do is also the profitable thing to do uh, then the world really begins to change um, so that's sort of how we think about that great um, so going to turn to some questions from the audience um, you know this panel was focused in, in large part on, on innovation but there's a good question i think uh, that just points out that there are many solutions that exist already um, to what extent does the panel agree that the that the uh, agree efforts might better focus towards implementing these rather than on innovations? Um, and I guess uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Marcelo and, and then maybe Claire or but anyone feel free to jump in. Yeah, thank you. So, so I do think um, that yeah, there, there's a lot of innovations that we know how to implement and we just need to scale them up. But I also, on the ocean plastics, for example, issue, I always have the, the, the clarity that, and I think we should have that clarity. There's some stuff we just got to get rid of, you know, single use plastics, you know, uh, doesn't make any sense. Uh, plastic bags. I mean, we, we're, nobody misses them here in Chile. It's around 2 billion plastic bags less that we don't consume a year. It's huge. A lot of stuff you used to see everywhere. You used to have, you know, almost 200 per person per year. Um, and you've seen them everywhere. So the thing is really it support, helps people support the fact that you don't want to contribute to more pollution. And I, and I bring this uh, example uh, when I was traveling in Rwanda. 
Rwanda also has a plastic bag ban. And, you know, in many developing countries, you see a lot of trash everywhere. This is the first uh, country in Africa I've seen that there's, I've seen virtually no trash in the streets. And it comes from the fact that you have this culture that you do not want to contribute. So I do think that there are innovations and we have recycling laws and you could do all sorts of cool stuff with technology and have, you know, clothes made out of, uh, you know, uh, recycled, recycled um, plastic uh, bottles, et cetera. But if you don't have uh, put an end to the bad stuff, uh, we're just going to be lamenting. And the reality is today we have, you know, tons, uh, billions of tons of, of plastic going into the ocean. And it's going to be way harder to reduce that than CO2 in the atmosphere. So the thing is, uh, that's why I think we had to make efforts into having both sticks and carrots to have the solutions be implemented in a timely fashion. Great. I, does somebody else want to jump in? Oh, great. Yeah, I'd just like to say that I have eight resorts here in French Polynesia, and we've banned single-use plastics throughout all of my resorts. So, jump in that. That's all set. Great. Great. Claire, Claire, it looked like you also. Maybe one little point. And Richard, uh, I'm sure we all want to visit you at some point. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, maybe on this concept uh, please, of innovation. Please do, by the way, with COVID, we'll all be better off if you come visit us. I can promise you that. Um, I guess one of the key questions about innovation is, of course, do you really need it or not? In some cases, there's no other way. Uh, typically, aquaculture has been around for thousands of years. Aquaculture has been around for thousands of years. However, now we're getting up to a, a scale of industrial aquaculture that we need to sort of um, try to master uh, the problems. Uh, there are so many issues in terms of pollutions coming from this intensive aquaculture in Asia, but also uh, uh, in different parts of Europe and South America. So at the end of the day, some of the innovations are a bit pushed on us uh, and some incremental changes are needed uh, just to make sure that we can uh, indeed again, master some of the the large monsters that, that have been created. There's this quote from um, uh, a French author called Saint-Exupéry, science without conscience is only a ruin of the soul. So the big challenge with innovation is that you, you need to actually control whatever you're trying to do and make sure that it's not uh, uh, putting a, a wrong impact, bad impacts on the environment at the end of the day. Oh, please. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, I think whoever, whoever asked that question is right on target. I think there are, I think innovation should be um, used for where it can help, but there are solutions that definitely already exist. Planting trees, for example, is amazing and uh, doesn't, you know, it, it does its job, uh, it exists for a purpose. Um, bags, you know, in the old days before plastics, um, there was no problem with using material bags instead of plastic bags as needed. So I think it's really um, uh, not going for the shiny object just because it's a shiny object, but is it really practical and useful? Right. And I think so a good uh, follow up in some respects to that is just how do we make sure uh, that innovation doesn't exacerbate existing inequalities? Um, in ocean-based economies. Um, and, I, and I open that really to anyone who might want to take it. So I'm, I'm just gonna jump in quickly. I think actually um, the intent is that innovation in some cases does help uh, equalize in the sense that um, as we improve on older technologies, um, things are getting cheaper, they're getting easier to use, um, which then makes it more accessible to more people. Uh, including citizen scientists, right, globally. But um, so there, there are now um, technologies out there that can be used. I'm going back to that ocean acidification sensors, for example, before you'd need to have a ship and go out to sea and it would be very expensive and you'd need to have a laboratory to do that. Now you can get a sensor and you can put it out and leave it there and gather the data in countries that previously have not had that opportunity. So 
since 2016 or so, they've been deployed around um, across the Pacific, small island nations uh, in the Indian Ocean, where there was zero ocean acidification measurements before off the coast of Africa, um, and even around Antarctica. So I think that's where innovation can really help uh, uh, to equalize uh, the whole uh, um, data gathering, on at least. Absolutely. Uh, does anyone else want to jump in? I have one other question, but would love to hear others. Um, okay. <laughs> well, the other question is also in some ways a, a follow up to, to the discussion uh, we were having just, you know, what's the role for, for regulation, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, uh, oceans and, and maritime issues where, you know, the, the regulation is a little bit more difficult than on land in a particular country. So, um, Marcelo, you unmuted, so maybe you start. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So first off, I think these global issues require globalism, which is a bad word in some places, but we do need to collaborate. We do need, we do need to uh, work together on this. And one, one of the issues, and I know Max Bello, who is in the, in the, in the public, uh, does a lot of work in that, is that we need to collaborate against um, illegal fishing, for example. You know, uh, a lot of the legal fishing fleets that come from Asia, come into the Galapagos Islands, come into the Revilla Quijero Islands in Mexico, come into Chile's um, islands, and we need to collaborate and we need to fight illegal fishing together. If we don't do that, if we don't have a mandatory way to regulate illegal fishing, we're not going to be able to do this. We need to cover, uh, you know, issues, the high seas, for example. High seas uh, fishing is, is not uh, profitable. It's highly subsidized, and we need to ban it out altogether. You know, we need to have ecosystems uh, be able to recover, and if we don't work together on this, it's not going to happen either. So, regulations are very important, but also international collaboration is fundamental in this. And one last thing is now we're starting to see oceans coming into the UNFCCC sphere. Uh, we're going to st start recognizing the efforts that we can do to protect our oceans as a way to either mitigate or, ad or adapt to climate change. But we need better science to be make better decisions on that. So that would be the, ba the, the, the basic uh, vision on this. And I, it's great that now in the U.S. we will have a player that will come back and collaborate uh, with us into these big global goals that we need to achieve. Great. Uh, yes, I would, we have. I would add that. Uh, sorry. I was going to say one, it would be a closing remark because we're just out of time, but I don't want to cut you off. So please go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that the oceans, the global oceans, are a huge common area. And regulation is absolutely necessary on a global scale, which is difficult. We have the Treaty of the Seas. It requires cooperation among nations to avoid the tragedy of the commons. The oceans are plundered. They're simply plundered and they're polluted, partly because the, the, uh, the, uh, the highly evolved apex predator species on the planet, humans, is a terrestrial creature, not an ocean creature. We don't understand the oceans. And, and so we don't care about them the way we should. And being a common, a huge common area, uh, it's, uh, it, it really requires global cooperation and regulation. And, and without that, uh, you know, we're going to eventually be 10 or 12 billion people on the planet. And it's going to be, it's going to cause irreversible damage if we don't, if we don't get our act together. Well, that is a good note um, to end on. I, I want to thank all the panelists. I thought that was a very um, interesting and enlightening discussion. Thank you all for, for doing that, uh, for taking the time. Um, next, we are going to uh, move on to some inspirational remarks on innovation uh, from Veronica de la Cerda. She's CEO of Tri, Tri, Tricyclos. I hope I got that right. Um, but Veronica, thank you. Hi, Triciclos. <laughs> Triciclos, sorry. Triciclos. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you uh, for inviting me here. Um, I'm actually Veronica de la Cerda. I'm the CEO of Triciclos. I'm thrilled and very honored to be here. It was a very interesting panel. 
And I'm here to share with you how we in Triciclos are contributing to the health of our oceans and, and this race to zero, right? We are in fact uh, committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2030. We started more than a decade ago with a clear purpose, which is eliminate the generation of waste. Uh, and we've been doing so here from Chile, uh, where I'm located, uh, but also in many other countries in Latin America. Considering that back then, right, there weren't any EPR uh, or similar systems to control and manage recyclable waste here in Latin America, we started with a very um, a focused approach on downstream, helping divert waste streams from landfills or nature, right, towards a more sustainable end. We implemented pre-recycling stations located in commercial and public spaces where people could bring their own recyclables, separate them, and our team could send them directly to the recycling plants. We expanded throughout the entire country and also moved to Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, we're starting Mexico now, managing what ended up being the biggest recycling station network um, in Latin America. We have sent more than 40,000 metric tons of materials to recycling plants that otherwise could have ended up in the nature or uh, in landfills. But the main purpose of these stations uh, was to create a conversation with consumers. So helping them understand the impacts of their consumption habits while they separated the materials, as well as learn how could they consume differently and consume better. We are a big corporation and that's so um, we have uh, a lot of interest in having a social aspect on what we do. So these stations were also designed to be managed by former waste pickers, giving them a secure space to work, promoting the formality of their work and highlighting the contribution that they can actually bring to society after decades of experience in the field. Through all these years, we've encountered many difficulties, COVID-19 being one, one of those. Uh, we had to close all of our recycling stations to control the pandemic, so we were forced to innovate fast. We couldn't allow all those materials to end up in landfills on nature, so we accelerated the creation of a digital platform, an app, uh, which allow us to um, create a secure, secure place in the station by controlling access and guaranteeing sanitary conditions. But this also presented an opportunity for digitizing the educational component of our, of our stations by providing it through the same app. Now we have thousands of users. We are adding new features to this app, like our previously developed recyclability index for packaging, and also giving consumers access to a circular marketplace, all designed to help them consume better. In Triciclos, we believe waste is a design error. And we talk about this. It's in the designing process where the biggest part of the solution relies on. So in parallel to all this recyclable waste management business, we started helping companies to design out waste. We provide them with digital solutions to control and improve the recyclability of their packagings. We measure the impacts of their products along the entire value chain, like the ones mentioned before with the life cycle analysis, for example. And through innovation-led processes, we even help them question their own business models to make them more circular, helping move away maybe from recycling and stepping into all other layers of circularity. We are indeed moving ahead with one of them in a joint venture precisely dedicated to a refillable solution for home care products. And we're also helping delivery industry, very popular now, right, in COVID-19, in implementing a returnable packaging approach, starting from the food delivery uh, in order to reduce the amount of waste generated through single-use uh, packaging. We also uh, know that there are many other barriers in implementing circularity, and they were mentioned here. Um, this is not only about in innovation, it's also about collaboration. It's about a systemic approach, collaboration to, through the entire value chains of products and also collaboration with the public sector. This really is uh, necessarily in order to close the loop of all these uh, different materials. As active participants and promoters of the new plastics economy initiative from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, right from the beginning, we managed to gather key stakeholders uh, of the plastic value chain in Chile around NPEX principles while Marcelo was in office, um, which led to later the first plastic pact in Latin America. We're studying the same processes in Brazil, Colombia, and hopefully now in Argentina. Triciclos and many others are working very hard 
But of course, this is not enough. By collaborating as experts in the recent uh, released study, Breaking the Plastic Wave from the Pew Charitable Trust and Systemic, that maybe you already read it, we learned that with the current commitments, we will only reduce 7% of the annual plastic flows to the ocean. We're definitely not solving this issue yet. We need much more, to, much more action, right? We need ambition. But we not only need collaboration and ambition, we need meaningful innovation. We were talking right about this in the panel. It's not just innovating in whatever. It has to be an out of the box, socially conscious ideas from all parts of the world and especially the southern part of it. We need to put the consumer or user in the center of the solutions. And only by doing so, we will be in the right track of solving this design error that is waste. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, indeed, um, uh, very inspirational remarks. Uh, we're now going Hello, can you guys hear me? Did you miss my introduction before I before I before I started? <laughs> I did. I couldn't hear anything. I think. Okay, froze. I'm so I'm I, I apologize. My apologies. I just just after uh, Veronica uh, finished her remarks, I I introduced uh, introduced to Sheikh Ashan. Uh, uh, Ashan Ulatarik, and I apologize if I got your name wrong, but you are the CEO and founder of Cubex Global. And I just, and I don't know if this other, the rest of the introduction was missed, but these are, we're going to be hearing from um, the uh, Uplink Sprint uh, prize winners who work at the nexus of ocean and, and climate uh, fitting with the theme of, uh, of today. So uh, my apologies again for dropping out. No worries. Um, hello everyone from the sunny city of Dubai in uh, UAE. My name is Sheikh Esan Tariq, and I'm the CEO and founder at Cubex Global. We started Cubex Global back in 2018, and it was um, at that point we were researching in the maritime industry, and we came across this uh, problem firsthand that um, LCL shipments, um, putting cargo on LCL shipments is very hassle-some. And initially, we started with building a blockchain-based solution for organizing the documents in supply chain across the supply chain from start to finish. And uh, we realized and we pivoted that there was a bigger problem in this industry since the era of containerization. And that was that 100 million shipping containers every year go up to 40% empty, shipping empty year from one port to the other. And this is basically a $24 billion problem that the maritime industry has to, um, uh, it's the cost of operating in this current uh, business model. And um, this also produces around 280 million tons of carbon emissions, which is roughly about 50, 55,000 empty vessel trips, which are extra and carrying no cargo. So we built an independent marketplace called Cubex Global. It's a B2B2C uh, marketplace where we take this um, exclusive empty space, which is going to be shipped anyways. We put it exclusively onto our platform and um, in a, in a bidding auction model, uh, different uh, industry stakeholders from SMEs to manufacturers and even end consumers can then bid and buy these on spot onto our website. Um, starting uh, in 2018, we launched uh, our POC and we, it was very successful. And by the end of uh, last year in December, we launched publicly. And since then, uh, we have seen that we have grown um, massively because uh, this was a, a fairly uh, a big problem that was uh, faced by many SMEs and manufacturers. And uh, back in April, we saw that um, due to the global pandemic situation, the entire uh, supply chain uh, was choked up due to vessels not reaching on time or manufacturers not being able to produce. 
and there was a lot of uh, demand or demand went up by three times so uh, this whole problem of is not just uh, about this uh, empty space which is being shipped it it starts from where um, and and a freight forwarder books uh, thousands of containers in advance um, years up to three years in advance on multiple different corridors and shipping routes and um, it's bound every container is bound against time and every set container has a, a specific time when the doors will be closed and it will be put onto a ship regardless of its uh, uh, you know status being empty or full and freight forwarders are running against time constantly to fill this empty space and there's no independent marketplace or a, a centralized system where two parties from the same shipping port you know uh, going to the same destination can actually figure out that we are sending half empty containers and we can merge them so cubex global um, came out with this marketplace and we we built the solution and we've seen since um, uh, early this year uh, that our demand has gone up by three times and we we are right now struggling with supply we're right now struggling with supply and we're trying to fulfill um, this sudden uh, uh, increase in demand um, over the last year, we have also learned that there's uh, a lot of interest um, from a marketplace perspective with regards to brokers who are actually uh, booking shipments in advance through historical data. And there's a, a market within a market, which is the pricing and hedging and um, you know uh, future uh, future futures market. So from um, the uh, start of this year. Uh, till now, we have done in excess of uh, 5,000 shipments, and uh, we are very close to uh, hitting the 1 million mark by the end of this uh, year. And at the moment, we are running our uh, Series A round of funding. We were um, we just closed our seed round of funding where the government of Oman invested in us. The UAE government um, has become a strategic partner, and we are talking to several other governments within the Middle East to um, help us with this initiative and have strategic alliances to uh, promote uh, this marketplace model, which not only reduces shipping port trips, but, all, but also has a massive impact on the uh, marine ecosystem. Great. Um, uh, that, I'm oh. open for questions uh, if anybody wants to. Well, I think I, I don't know that there's I don't know that there's time built in um, for Q and A, but I, I'm certainly um, um, you know I'll, I'll take cues from from the from uh, from the forum. But um, but I I'll, for now we'll we'll move to uh, Karen Scofield Seal, uh, who is uh, uh, the CEO and founder of Oceania. Oceania. Uh, I, thank you, Karen. Yes. Thanks, Justin. Uh, hi, everybody, um, and well, thanks for an amazing discussion so far, uh, really interesting. Um, so yes, I'm CEO and co-founder of Oceanium, and Oceanium was started in June of 2018. I, that's when I was introduced to my co-founder, who is a um, biochemist. His name's Dr. Charlie Babington. He's located up at the European Marine Science Park up in Oban, Scotland. Uh, and I went to Charlie and I said, I want to make um, packaging uh, from seaweed. And he said, that's great. I think we can do that. Um, but there's a lot of valuable food and nutrition products in, in seaweed as well. Um, so that is how the business model uh, was born. And, and this is the business model here in a nutshell. Um, we want to enable sustainable seaweed farming at scale. Um, there's actually a different slide for that. But, um, and the reason being is uh, that uh, seaweed sequesters carbon. It absorbs excess nitrogen. Um, it creates, uh, seaweed farms create a, a bit of a marine protected area so that the fish uh, and the wildlife know that, that they can go there, there's you no know, fishing or dredging, and so uh, increases biodiversity. Um, it's a fantastic source of healthy and nutritious food. It's uh, full of vitamins, minerals, algae oils, proteins, uh, uh, and increasingly important with uh, drought conditions and soil erosion. Um, and unlike competing feedstocks, it does not need cleared land, fresh water, insecticide, or fertilizer. Um, you know, so for example, soya uh, from Brazil, it's, you know, something that can grow, grow locally and uh, be consumed locally. Um, so this is the business model. We um, will purchase fresh, wet seaweed from, from seaweed farmers, uh, bring it into a biorefinery facility, which will be located near the seaweed farm, and using um, all 
green and clean um, chemistry and innovative uh, proprietary technology, which Charlie has developed, we will extract the maximum value. So using all the different elements of the seaweed um, and extract protein and fiber and uh, high value nutraceuticals, bioactives, which are good for immune uh, systems and gut health. Uh, and then we use the remaining biomass to make a biopackaging material. Um, it's not bio, bioplastic, it is a all natural material that is designed to be uh, home compostable and marine safe. Um, and Ting, if you can, I can show some of the samples if you can put the, the camera back up. Uh, so where we are, we, we are new, we are still in R&D. Uh, the next step is to do to prove the processing at scale, um, and then to and then to to do a, a demo biorefinery facility. Uh, the the packaging material will be uh, patented. We will be applying for patents going with that forward. Uh, and I think the important thing to remember here is, and you know, kind of uh, I just I was really interested in what you all were talking about earlier in terms of. Um, the coastal zones, but also, you know, innovative and making sure that, you know, there's no unintended consequences. And I think that is something that we are really adamant about. I mean, we are definitely a social impact business. Um, we're measuring our impact against uh, five of the SDGs. We have two life cycle analysis in, in progression right now. Uh, and we'll continue to measure and report our impact as we develop the business. Um, but it is really important to us that the industry grow in a um, sustainable and managed way, uh, unlike other forms of agriculture <laughs> that were mentioned earlier. Um, and, and with thus, we are working, for example, with uh, Lloyd's Register Foundation, uh, the UN Global Compact, Seaweed Manifesto, and uh, also uh, Seaweed for Europe. So really working with, uh, with industry stakeholders, working with small scale farmers, um, you know, to make sure that it works for everybody uh, across the value chain. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Karen. Um, very interesting. Um, uh, and finally, we have Declan McAdams, who is the chairman of Pinovo, uh, and who is our final Uplink uh, Sprint winner today. Hello. I want to explain to you today how technological innovation in a seemingly mundane area like rust removal can have a material positive impact on ocean health strengthening and improving the ocean's resilience to the effects of climate change. So let's start at the beginning. Not many people realize that paint is plastic and the industrial and marine worlds are full of steel assets that are covered in paint to protect them from corrosion. However, that force of nature, corrosion, can only be slowed down, it cannot be stopped. And as those steel assets corrode, paint residuals, approximately 50% of which are made up of plastic, fall into the sea as microplastics. On top of that, when the asset owner decides to repaint the asset, they must firstly remove the old paint and rust. And to do that, they generally use the traditional methods of either open grit blasting, which you see here, or high pressure water jetting. And the end result, well, the old paint residuals now crushed into microplastics end up in the environment, and most often in the oceans, because those steel assets I spoke about are generally located in the sea, oil rigs and ships, over the sea, bridges, or beside the sea, oil refineries and shipyards. To put that into perspective, and taking just the 184 oil rigs in the North Sea, sandblasting and water jetting on those rigs alone cause paint microplastic emissions that are the equivalent to dumping 14 million plastic bottles into the North Sea every year. We estimate that globally between one and a half and 2.25 million tons of paint microplastics are dumped into the oceans every year. Now compare that to total plastic weight of 8 million tons entering the oceans annually, and you realize that this is a very big, but little known problem. So you might say, that's not good. Well, what has it to do with climate change and the race to zero? Well, very simply, Pinovo, a Norwegian company, has developed and patented vacuum blasting technology that will protect ocean health, reducing the impact of climate change on the oceans in two ways. Firstly, Pinovo reuses the blasting grit up to 20 times. This significantly reduces grit production and its transport, and in this way, lowers the life cycle CO2 emissions by over 60% compared to the traditional method of open blasting. It may not be zero emissions, but it's a big step in the right direction. On top of that, we can recycle the used grit to give it more lives and future maintenance operations, further reducing CO2 emissions. Secondly, by stopping all those paint microplastic emissions entering the ocean, we protect ocean health and biodiversity, 
considerably strengthening the capacity of the oceans to mitigate the negative impacts of climate change. It really is that simple in theory. In practice, it's much more challenging to convince a traditional industry, surface maintenance, to change its practices that go back over 100 years. For that reason, we are very grateful to Uplink and the Forum for their support of our efforts to put the issues of paint microplastics and stopping open blasting over the oceans on the agenda. We need people to realize that paint is plastic. So next time you're driving over a bridge and you see someone repainting the bridge and blasting off the old paint and rust, ask yourself, how is the blasting being done? In a good old traditional manner where the grit is used only once and then the whole lot, including grit, rust and paint microplastic residuals are all dumped into the ocean or cleanly with vacuum blasting, with reuse and collection of the grit and recovery of all the paint microplastic residuals for recycling or safe disposal. Even better, why not raise this issue at a political or regulatory level in your municipality or at a national level? The anti-pollution laws are already in place in most parts of the world. What's needed now is awareness and you can play your part in making this happen. As I hope you've seen this afternoon, changing from dirty, traditional blasting to innovative and sustainable clean vacuum blasting can make a significant positive contribution to improved ocean health and to climate change mitigation. So remember, paint is plastic and stop open blasting over the oceans. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on. And it seems like we lost Justin, but we're going to bring up Atsushi Tsunami. We're so grateful to have you today. Thank you so much, um, Atsushi, for being here. And if you could please provide us with closing remarks. It's quite interesting that our technology and innovation session had so many <laughs> technological glitches, but we appreciate yeah. everybody being here and we really look forward to your remarks. Thanks again for joining us at such a late hour in Japan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. And I hope that uh, Justin will come back. Okay. Uh, so, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my apologies. I uh, once again <laughs> delivered the introduction. Oh, okay. Well, you've already been introduced. So thank right. you for joining us at 1 a.m. Please, sorry. Okay. Hey, um, thank you. And I, I also uh, thank all the uh, speakers for sharing with us your uh, inspiring stories about how you are promoting innovations for a sustainable ocean, including various uh, important uh, uh, business models that you have been developing. And I think they're very important to have not only uh, technologies and solutions to all the ocean, uh, uh, to create a sustainable ocean, but also the uh, business models are very important to actually uh, um, implement those uh, technologies. And, and to really create the innovations and, 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 and solve the uh, ocean, climate ocean problems. And um, uh, I'm, once again, I'm Atsushi Tsunami, the uh, president of uh, Sasaga Peace Foundation and also heads the Ocean Policy Research Institute uh, in Japan. Our foundation promotes international partnerships for uh, peace and prosperity and security. And, and the, uh, uh, our institute undertakes uh, research for achieving a sustainable ocean. And I'd like to thank the high level com champions for global climate action uh, and the UNFCCC uh, Secretariat and the World Economic Forum and Friends of Ocean Action and all the partners for organizing and joining this uh, session and giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Um, and your stories have been reaffirmed that the ocean is ex extensively embedded in our economy and there are uh, myriads of challenges and opportunities to sh address the nexus of climate and, and ocean. In, in order to further uh, boost contributions from ocean-based sectors for climate change uh, mitigation, 
we need to facilitate the transformation of uh, the maritime sector as a whole through enabling policies and supply chain uh, transitions. So we need to create co-benefits and synergies and provide incentives to innovate uh, innovative business models through uh, market uh, measures, industry standards and government policies and regulations. And today I heard so many good uh, examples all over the world uh, challenging uh, these uh, uh, or joining this effort, uh, spearheading this effort. And we need to accelerate the application of innovative technology to enhance uh, sustainab sustainability through the uh, life cycle approach. Effective local actions should be shared and uh, scale up. So science is at the heart of the technological development and innovations. And technologies uh, should also be available for adaptation to ensure inclusive and equitable development. The world is heading um, um, uh, towards the net zero GH uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, in Japan, uh, Prime Minister Suga finally announced uh, last month the zero, uh, net zero emission target by 2050. Uh, as we move towards the carbon-free society, ocean-based solutions have a significant role to play in fitting the GHG greenhouse gas reduction gaps. Um, ocean-based uh, mitigation options, including ocean-based uh, renewable energy, uh, may contribute up to 21% of additional mitigation measures to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050. So our institute, OPRI, has a long-standing commitment to multi-stakeholder uh, uh, dialogues and actions to facilitate the discussions on ocean and climate issues at uh, UNFCCC. We have been an active member of the Marrakesh Partnership and uh, have contributed to the development of ocean and coastal zone pathway to achieve the net zero by 2050. To provide analytical building blocks for these efforts, OPRI is carrying out uh, studies on ocean-based mitigation, uh, potential focusing uh, on wind power potential uh, for seaweed beds uh, as a new blue carbon ecosystem and climate uh, resilience, sustainable seafood. Each of us, uh, whether we represent the national and local governments, business are experts uh, or consumers, all have entry points and responsibility for taking actions and achieving sustainable ocean. In order to promote such multi-stakeholder dialogue, OPRI, uh, along with our partners, is taking part in another uh, GCA event, a Virtual Ocean Action Day on 20th November, to raise the momentum of, for UNFCCC Ocean and Climate Change Dialogue scheduled for 2nd to 3rd of December this year. So much can be said um, about today's rich and inspiring discussions. And I hope that uh, we can continue a dialogue like this one to uh, pioneer innovation for mitigating and adapting to climate change and achieving a sustainable ocean. Uh, we need to act uh, expeditiously and uh, must work uh, together to bolster our actions. Thank you again for great discussions and hope to see you in person next time. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Atushi Tsunami, who is the uh, president of the Saka Sasakawa Peace Foundation uh, and president of the Ocean Policy Institute uh, at SPF. Um, thank you for those uh, inspiring remarks, important remarks about putting science uh, at the center of innovation and, and technological solutions. Um, and with that, we conclude the program. I thank you all for joining. It's been um, a really enlightening discussion. Um, thank you again.